Our guest today is TV and radio presenter, Laura Woods. Hello. Welcome, Laura. How are you two? How are you? I'm slightly Why disappointed that <laughs> Joe managed to already? read his script properly oh. for the first time ever, Laura. <laughs> yeah, all right, mate. But that's because I was under a lot more pressure. Knowing what? how good Laura is at her job, oh. having listened for many an hour, <laughs> many an hour, many... See, it's already going wrong. I was, I was nervous. I was like, fuck, I can't have the fuck-ups I usually do about reading one line off a piece of paper. And I'm quite pleased with myself. You actually. look so smug. Yeah, as yeah. usual. You delivered it very well. The problem is, Laura, is that, <laughs> that has ruined the first five minutes of the show, which we're going to be you teaching Joe how to read a script. Oh. So I'll just cancel that bit that Steve's written in, shall I? I'm yeah, but the fact, surely it's taken me two years to get to this point of being able to read one line properly. How long did it take you to get good at that longer than two years honestly i did a screen test once for sky sports news to be a presenter and it was the most horrific experience of my life how does that go it was so bad how does a screen test what do you, you mean gen you genuinely i was a runner so i must have been about i don't know 21 or no i was about 22 i think oh that's so uh, shit in my head why? why i know where you're going i'm gonna get what Joe distance <laughs> Oh, so shit. That is bad. That's your jokes that you fucking get out of it. Me. Laura, can you just explain what a runner is for people? Who yes, are not sorry. Familiar? A runner is like a, a crap industry term for a junior. Yeah. And essentially, you're a runner because you make teas and coffees for everyone and you're the dog's body. So yeah. you're, you're sent to do anything and everything, basically. So you run. I mean, you don't physically run unless you're late. Um, and basically, that's where you start. I went in as work experience and then I became a runner. That was like the kind of like. Um, the order that you take and then you grow and you become an uh, editorial assistant, assistant producer, producer. And if you want to move over, you do what I did and you try and get over to something else, presenting or reporting. If you were actually running, it would make it quite hard with the beverages as well, wouldn't it? Because mm. you'd more likely to be spilled them, I guess. Have you ever seen Taken? Yeah. The film? Yeah. Have you, Tom? No. What? Tom. Are you fucking serious? Is it a Neeson one? Yes. Yeah. Is it the one where he says the, th the Neeson thing? Yeah. I, I will hunt you down and I will kill you. Is that he one? French? No, he does. <laughs> I will hunt you down. He doesn't put, he's not Irish <laughs> in this film. He puts on a normal accent. Go on in. No, I'm not doing the accent. Oh, yeah. No, no, the thing was, if you watch Taken Back and you watch it for the Look. first time, watch the daughter all the time in every single scene, she runs. <laughs> <laughs> Is that because she's being taken? Or she's trying not to. No, no. Move. So in that scene, she is running away from getting it. But in all the other scenes, she's still running. It fucking blows my mind. I'm watching. She's been spooked by the people trying to kidnap. She's running to her dad for a hug. She's running out the cab to get on a plane. She's running everywhere. She must be knackered. Anyway, back to the screen test. <laughs> you started as a runner yeah. and then did a screen test for Sky Sports. What? Yeah. Well, Sky Sports News. So you know how Sky Sports News, you, you're basically reading the news and it's on an autocue and all that sort of stuff. So. I thought that the, the only way, and probably the only way at the time to get into presenting or reporting was to go that route, go get a Sky Sports News screen test, become a newsreader. It all sounded really simple. Right? It was like, oh, brilliant. All I need to do is get the screen test. And then it's like my key into the door and all that. And it was the most horrific experience of my life. It was awful. I sat down and I didn't realise, I'd never realised until that point that I couldn't read an autocue and I couldn't read aloud, full stop. <laughs> full is, <laughs> is it harder than it looks then? It's so hard. Well, not for people who can read, <laughs> but I honestly, for a good five years after that, I thought I was dyslexic because I was like, how, how can I not read? But there's so many other things. Like if, like see this studio that you're in now, if you imagine like there's a big camera there, there's people working behind it, there's people but like these guys as well behind the screens that are watching you. Steve having his and, lunch. And you're essentially, hi Steve. It's a flapjack, isn't it? It was delightful. Oh, yeah. for fuck's sake. You gave me a flapjack. Nice. You're meant to be on the pulse. What's going on, mate? Help. <laughs> and then, yeah, you're you're just under this incredible pressure to read a script. You're only allowed to look at the script about five minutes before and it's quite long and you go through, I don't know, maybe like a 15 minute script or something like that. And every time you make a mistake, which I did, and I'm not joking, I would say at least one a sentence. Like imagine how horrific that is. And then it gets worse because you're like, oh no, everyone knows I'm crap. And then you're, you're getting progressively worse and more embarrassed. And it was, oh, it was just awful. 
I felt horrendous, like I was like this small. And then I walked out there thinking, well, I fucked that, didn't I? So I'm never going to be a presenter. So I canned it for like two years. That reminds me of back in 2015, we had a big uh, World Cup dinner before going away slash staying in the country because it was at home. Home World Cup, yeah. It was like a send-off dinner, but I was like, we're still here. It was a bad one. And I should have known from that night it was going to be bad because they made Chris Robshaw get up on stage (laughs) and do a speech. And it was a big, big uh, thousand people dinner and all that. And he's up there and he's on the podium and there's the auto cues, but there's two. So they're angled left and right so that he can look more natural. Yeah. (laughs) And we sat there watching it. And bless him, he's not the great, he wasn't the greatest speaker in public at the time. He was a doer. He was like, do as I do, not as I say. And we're like, fucking good job. And he goes, he gets up. <laughs> good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll do a better in England player, England player. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Oh, Mandela. <laughs> <laughs> Mandela's back. Hello, bloody boy. Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Chris Rob Shaw. <laughs> he turned his head. And because the or- he turned his head to look more natural, he went, Chris Rob Sure, on the thing, <laughs> and we're like, oh, fuck me. And is it that? But the fact that you've just said it is actually quite hard. It is, but can I have actually got a Chris Robshaw story? About auto cues? He didn't have an auto cue. Okay. This, was, this was the first. Does Chris listen to this? <laughs> Definitely not. Great. His first ever speech when he was England captain, I was there at Twickenham. So do you remember, like, me and, me and Joe, we, we've met through loads of different ways, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, but back in the day, my ex-boyfriend was was an England rugby player as yeah. well. And we were all very young at the time. And the first time he became England captain, he didn't have autogu. He had little bits of paper, like cue cards. Mm. And do you remember there's this scene from Friends where Ross <laughs> is taught how to do the speech. <laughs> and he has, and he's like, someone's told him that eye contact is really important. So, <laughs> so Chris, Chris, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Chris it doesn't like, look like you're that sorry. I know, it doesn't. I'm enjoying it. Chris was looking down at his papers, then he was reading a line, and then he was going... <laughs> so he's staring out every word. <laughs> he was, like, really aggressively delivering it. But obviously, he's, like, really well-spoken and, like, did it with the speech well. But it was the pauses in between and the looking around, and I just got the giggles. Sorry, Chris. Again. Thankfully, he is much better at it now. Yeah, I'm sure he's brilliant now, he's yeah. much better This was now. early, early days, by okay. the way. Did you find in your early days that you thought you had to do a different voice to the normal yeah. Laura voice? Yeah, yeah. So is this your like? normal voice? Yeah, this is my normal one. Completely legit? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. How do? How can we test that? I don't know. We can't. It's difficult, isn't it? What was your first, <laughs> your auto cue Laura voice when you first attempted it? Oh, shit. I don't even know if I can do it. You, you, like, I remember one of the first pieces of advice I was ever given by the boss of Sky Sports News at the time was look at all the other presenters because he was like, you're shit. And I was like, what, can I have some advice? Like when I knocked on his door and everything, like I need some feedback. And uh, that's not my real voice. <laughs> anyway, was that the auto cue? That? that was nah. <laughs> No wonder it didn't go well. Um, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is uh, Sky Sports News and... <laughs> Uh, it's uncomfortable to watch because I've been told to look at all the other presenters whilst I'm talking. <laughs> Fucking hell. Can't concentrate. It was like that. Um, yeah, so I, uh, he, he said to me, go and watch Sky Sports News and be like them. Like, watch what they do and do that. And I was like, that's the... What? I even knew at the time, I was like, that's weird advice. I never took it, obviously. But I don't... I, I just remember put, putting on a very, like... Um, everything was very posh and you had to like get to the end of the sentence and I was like trying to enunciate everything and it didn't, it just didn't sound like me. Like I, I will I will fall in and out of um, well-spoken sentences depending on the company you keep. I think- Where the, are you from originally? I was born in Essex. I moved to central London. I grew up in Surrey, but not Surrey, like Croydon. Oh. <laughs> that's oh. the first time I've heard someone call Croydon Surrey. That was very judgmental, that oh, that you just did. Tom that. is very judgmental. <laughs> I tried to do the opposite. Well, my family went to Putney eventually, all right? <laughs> I was going <laughs> to say, so I was going to go Surrey, and then that's yeah. not Croydon. Well, Croydon technically is in Surrey, but it's not what you think. It was Catrum. Do you know Catrum? Catrum 7 Cars? I thought that was mm. Kent. Mm, on the border, maybe. This oh, it's a good close. section of the podcast, yeah. but carry on. <laughs> maybe like a few miles from the border, though. I'm trying, a roundabout way, trying to get out what, how's a, what, is that a real voice or not? If she's from Essex, born in central London, I mean, born in Essex, grew up yeah. in central London, went to Croydon, Caterham, 
she should be talking. She? Who's she? Cat's mother. Cat's <laughs> mother should be talking. Right, welcome then. Yeah, I'm from Croydon and thing, but you're not. You're like, no, hello. Because my mum's well spoken and my dad's Cockney. So I think you the thing is, I think any good person in our business becomes a chameleon. Do you know what I mean by that? So but your voice would change depending who you're talking to. If that's the case, if you're interviewed interview him Are you okay? If that's the case, mm. if you were interviewing Sashin Tendulkar <laughs> Don't make me do that. <laughs> well, I'm just saying you're a chameleon, so you you adapt to it. I I'll I find myself doing that with aura. different people from around the world. If I'm just sitting having a conversation with them, not for mm. work purposes that I've just met. After a little while, I start kind of mimicking yeah, their their voice, people, and I feel bad about it, but I no, quite like it. People think it's weird, but it's not. It's I honestly think it's actually. My mum said this to me once. She was like. It's actually a really great thing to be able to do because what you're essentially doing is is saying like, I'll make you feel comfortable by speaking in the same kind of tone or same kind of way that you speak so that I'm not over, under or overclassing you, if that's a real phrase. I think you're right. the only issue would be if the other person is also doing that and then, <laughs> and then they're lost. chasing your accent yeah. and you're chasing their version oh. of your accent and then yeah. you start chasing their version of your accent doing their accent. Oh, wow. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> It'll always end up in Mandela. It will. How would you interview Nelson Mandela if he Just was in like the studio that. today, Lord? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Think I'm winning that one. Thanks. Right. So you always wanted to be a TV presenter. What was what was the thing at school? Would you turn around to Miss Lacey and you go, "Oh, Miss Lacey, um, I want to be a TV presenter." How does that go down? Mm, no, I I wanted to be a vet when I was really young, and then I was not very good at science. So I was much better at English. So I think Press Packer is this thing. Do you remember um, News Round? Yeah. With uh, Lizo. 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 Yeah. And uh, no, Lizo's the main one that I remember. Lizo I love with a glass. Get home from school and then there's News Round. Yeah. And there, in fact, before that, it might have been Hey Arthur. Hey was Arthur was, yeah. Hey, hey Arthur was around then. I can't remember. Blue Peter, do you remember? Blue, Blue Peter, Peter. yeah. The Queen's Nose. The Queen's Nose. This is nose. definitely fucking not about the pod. News do you, round. Do you remember the, hang on a minute, do you remember the fucking, the watch? Was Bernard's watch. Bernard's watch. Unbelievable. I thought about it all the time. I Loved it. it My parents are alien. Aliens. My parents are aliens. That's ITV though, you know. Mm, dark I side. I don't mix it, mix it out. Um, news round. Yeah, news round. So you wanted to be a press thing. packer on news round. Yeah, they had this thing where you could be a, a kid reporter and you had to like fill in a, like, a I don't remember if you called up and got a form it doesn't matter whatever I applied somehow I can't remember how you apply but I never got it but that was the first time I was like oh that looks cool doesn't it Laura one of the most difficult things I would imagine about your job is what is known in the business as open talkback oh, would you like to be. first of all tell us what open talkback is and then let's yeah. try and fuck with Joe's head yeah. by giving him open talkback well, while <laughs> excellent <laughs> let's invite people o on to open talkback <laughs> is like the devil so you're just trying to say you've just been interviewing me for the past five minutes. Yeah. So imagine you call that interviewing, do you? Yeah, I, I like <laughs> cool. it. It's yeah. a casual style. Yeah. Imagine doing that, but then someone's in the back of your head talking to you the whole time. So saying, you, what what it is is it's producer, director, PA. Those are the those are the minimum three that you'll get, unless you have closed talk back. But we don't have that really. It doesn't really work. So producer is the one that's telling you what he wants you to say necessarily, like go down this route, go down that route. When you get good, you don't need that. And actually it's better to not have that. Like, you know what you want to ask. You don't need the questions, but you're a, you're a beginner. So you need the producer in your ear. Then you've got the director who's saying camera one, camera two, cut to this, cut to that, roll in this, roll in that, blah, 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 blah. And then you've also got the PA who's counting. So she's the one that's going, you've got 30 seconds on this chat, 10 seconds on this chat, five, four, three, two, one, done. They're all talking to you in your head? Yeah, at the same time. Right, Laura, let's do this. Um, Joe... At the same time? Don't you think it'd yeah. be more efficient if they just went, uh, uh, Steve, you go first. <laughs> it you say, and then I'll say, it doesn't work like no. that. You haven't got enough time. You need all of the information at once. So, Joe, you're going to tell us about your journey into the studio today. Laura, would you like to be producer, director, 
PA, which ones would you like to take? I'll take the other one. I'll be producer and PA. Okay. Oh, so I'll be director. So I'm just talking cameras. through cameras. Okay. Yeah. So, Joe, you start talking as if you are broadcasting about your day. Me and Laura are going to fuck yeah. with your head. Okay. So what you've got to do is 30 seconds without saying um and I'm just upping it. Sorry. No ums. 30 seconds. Yeah, no ums and no ahs or anything like that. Also, it's live TV, so no fucks, twats, yeah, nothing. Yeah, no fucks or buggers. And you've got to tell us how you got here, and I'm going to be giving you directions in your ear. Right, Laura, you ca- as PA, count him in. Hey, uh, Siri, can I have a 30 second clock, please? Fuck me, dead. <laughs> um, Ready? I'm going to count you down. I'm going to be your PA now, so I've got you. So counting down in five, four, three, one ready. two, one, cue. Good morning, count Vietnam. Two, zoom and, in uh, what, fuck! <laughs> She said the er. Uh, you said no ers. Go again. No, no. Okay, Fuck. counting you down in three, two, one. Camera one and two. Ready. Good morning, Vietnam. Camera one. Welcome to the no. show. Mandela. I would like <laughs> to say camera three. that my day started with a... Uh, Tell the audience. Camera one. I woke up late. What time did you wake up? After my wife nudged me. Look camera down two. the right camera. Uh, and they went. <laughs> yeah. She she said to me, "You are late. You you know it's half past Camera six. One, move into Joe's and you're uh, ne- you're going, going to be late for your drag rehearsals. Less of that nose. And, uh, less of the nose. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking Five, hell, four, mate! You can't say three, you can't insult people. Two, and have a Joe. wonderful day. <laughs> Less of that nose. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck me. I thought it was meant to be a support network, like helping you out there. You didn't help. You're telling me to look at three different cameras. <laughs> the right camera. Well, I, how do I know which one's the right camera? It's hard to listen, was it? It was tough. So that happens, does it? Yeah, you can play with the levels. So you can have us a bit quieter if it helps. But that must be... That, that little bit of role play in itself made me slightly nervous, even though it's not live and Steve's definitely going to edit to make it look better. But... <laughs> How do you do? Do you not? When the first time you did that, you must have shit yourself. Yeah, I did massively. Yeah. You but what about doing it now? No. Do you feel polished being able to yeah, do it? Yeah. Now it feels weird not having it because you just get used to it. So, like in America, I did a show in America recently, and those three roles are one person. So you feel like your safety blanket isn't there because now I want to know what cameras you're on. I want to know like whether you're on camera one or camera two. I want to know if you're on me or if you're on something in the arena or whatever. So you you kind of like, you want to know those things. And when you work in TV for a long time, you get like a kind of mental image of what's happening anyway. So when I don't have that, if I don't have open talk back, if it's closed or keyed, which means the director only keys me when he thinks I need to hear from him or the PA only keys me when she thinks the count is like, like coming up to 10 seconds or something like that. I don't like it because it feels, I don't know, it feels strange. But it depends. If you've got a director and you're like, fuck it now, then I'll have him on keyed. <laughs> have you ever had chat, Laura, which it has no practical purpose? Like you might have someone in the gallery talking about what they're having for lunch. Yeah. Oh, the PAs. PAs are a nightmare for that. I what does PA I, stand for? Um, I actually don't even know. Production assistant. Okay. I think. Yeah. I think. So she's literally, she's the one that counts everything. And they're always female? N- they're usually, no, not always, oh. but they're majority female. But okay. they're not always, so yeah. Okay. There is there is a PA in my line of work who I've worked with for a number of years who is a fucking nightmare because she just doesn't stop talking and she's talking about other shit and you can tell it's going on and you're like, oh, I don't, and I'm, I don't want to be horrible and I'll never do that or anything and I'll kind of nudge a little bit like, it's a bit loud in the gallery, isn't it? And they're like, are you all right there? And they're like, oh, um, is it? Like, everyone's everyone's like fine. And I'm like, they're fucking not. Like, can you just... And every now and then I just want to say, stop it. Because any extra noise, it's not that the noise is... Ne- it, for me, it's that I know it's there, so that's what's bugging me. Because I'm like, stop it. I'm trying to do my job and you need to do yours. If I was a PA and I really didn't like <laughs> the presenter, I would just... I remember doing it to my maths teacher. In fact, all of us did it. It was really... And now I look back on it, it's, it's bullying. We <laughs> bullied our maths teacher. I think we were what like... What did you do? 13. We all decided to hum. Oh. The classic. Like, we were just... Mm, so that's what I'd be doing. I'd be in your ear just going... Mm, <laughs> so annoying. And you go, excuse me, what's that noise? I've got some interference in my head. And I'll be like, don't know, I can't hear it. Sorry, Laura, you'll have to just... Mm, carry on fuck i want to be a pa now did you because all i want to be is a pa (laughs) the thing about that trick on the teacher is they can't tell who's doing it yeah 
Well, no, well, no I know that. That was. That was part of <laughs> Thanks for <laughs> pointing that That's out. Why it I works. fucking know that it worked. <laughs> they came. He said, "I'm going to get deputy head. Go on, go get Mr. Kempson then." And you know what's really weird, and I'm only going to share this because I feel like I'm in good weird company. <laughs> When my mum used to hoover when I was younger and I'd be, you know, you'd be lying on the sofa and she'd be like hoovering around you. I used to hum. And then when she turned the hoover off to be like, what was that? I'd stop. And then when she'd turn it on again. You'd fuck with her hoovering. <laughs> would you try and replicate the exact note of the hoover or would yeah. you? Mm. What section of the episode are we going to use? <laughs> Have we got a weird bin <laughs> that we can use as the, just a mashup at the, the thing? Why are you humming? To, Why are that? you humming? <laughs> Oh, I was doing it. Why to both fuck of you the teacher off? I was doing it to fuck her off. Oh, that's nasty. But she didn't like. It wasn't. She couldn't tell if it was a human doing it or something else. She was like, what? and I just be sat there like chilling out. Like, it was so I'm gonna weird. go home and do it to my kids. Now. <laughs> do it. It's, it's part so of the main reason of having kids, so that I can just reuse all these jokes on there. Mm. What was that, Daddy? <laughs> mm. None of them. Um, what really pissed me off was you were talking, and someone. I think it was Ryan. When in my ears. And I have no idea. I was trying to listen to you, and I couldn't hear what Ryan said. I'm sure he said something about ads. What he said, Joe, was, can we go to the ads, but make Joe go to the ads while Laura talks in his ear to try and put him off? Oh, I'd like to go to the ad break. How did you hear that? Because I was listening. You weren't listening to Laura then, were you? <laughs> yeah. You're fucking rude. Go, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so do you want me to give you a line to go to the break with? Yeah. Please. Um, say coming up coming up after the break we're gonna speak to Harry Redknapp about the England game last night. Harry Redknapp's coming on. And then and then <laughs> give me a time check, just say it's like quarter past one or something like that. And also name check the show. Fucking hell, that's a lot. It is isn't Three, it? name check your show. Two, so who's coming up? Go. Coming up after the break is Harry Redknapp. Joe, we're getting a cup of tea after. So Lucky stay tuned. Ten, it's nine. quarter past one. Seven. Fuck me. Oh, five. <laughs> That's the only director and producer there. Some ads. Just listen to the ads whilst I gather my shit. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> that those those things we call hard counts, and they are shit. So sometimes, like your hard count is the reason it's hard is because you cannot go over it. So it's like five, four, three, two, one, and one is dead. And if you fall over one then you're falling out of air or you're like, you're hitting a break or you're you're just, you're, you fucked it. <laughs> Joe, you've got three minutes of adverts to get that right. And then when we come out of the adverts, we're going to do that again and see if you've learned. Oh, I thought we'd already done that. No, because we didn't say we'd come out of the ads. Okay, you saying come out of the ads. Come out of the ads. Go on then. So those were the ads. Joe, take us out of the ads into the next section while me and Laura fuck with your head. But you've just come out of the ads. <laughs> Why do I have to fucking come out of the ads again? <laughs> this is more fun. Oh, I see. You're trying to <laughs> add content to the thing. Um, no, neither of you are fucking with my head. Oh, you fucking yeah! head. And you're not even talking to me. Is it? Those were the ads. Um, is is live, live? Is that it? That was just going to be it. What did I say? Those were the ads. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm so slick at it now. That you didn't even notice that I said it. Impressive. Very Those impressive. were the ads. Laura, yeah. when they say live, yeah. is it live, live? Like, yeah. so you can't make any fuck ups whatsoever. Yeah. But you're you're better. I really believe this. You're better when you're live than when you're pre-recorded. Because when you're pre-recorded, you know you can make mistakes, so you just do. This is so reassuring the, the, for us, Joe. The yeah. adrenaline kicks in, and I, you go right. Yeah, I'm going to cope under I, pressure. I promise you, if you guys did this show live, then it would be way better. It would be a show. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, honestly. Uh, it seems as though there was a laugh <laughs> really quite loud <laughs> at that suggestion. <laughs> Laura, you clearly haven't listened to any fucking episodes of this. <laughs> if you did, you realise this can't be live. This you'll, cannot be live. One day you'll do it live. I promise. Tom. You. <laughs> That'll be your, why don't you just make that your challenge? Because then you can't fuck up. But then what you do is you just realise that you find ways of catching yourself. And then you then you can catch pretty much anything. It's fine. Well, there's there's famous fuck ups mm. um, from people that have been doing it years. Two of my favourites are the first one. I can't remember his name. Jessica Ennis. Good night. Otis Dealey. Yeah. Mm. What? Well, sorry. What are those two? Ah, oh, sorry. So Channel Four took over the coverage of the 2011 Athletics World Championships at short notice. Yeah. Brought in a presenter who was very good at presenting stuff. Name. Who's 
Otis Dealey. But say that again. Otis Dealey. Otis Dealey. So Otis might have even done news round, you know. <gasps> okay. He started in kids' TV, didn't he? Didn't he, yeah. So he hadn't covered track and field before. Yeah. And was it a hard outlaw as described? It sounded yeah. like he had something in his head and then someone in his ear has gone, three, two. Yeah. It was, it was, I, in, from my experience now, it was hard out. I remember seeing it and I'm not even taking the mick of him here because it was my worst nightmare. And when I saw that, I remember at the time thinking it was amusing and then thinking, you're going to get some karma for that, like genuinely, because what had happened was he'd, in my, in my opinion, I don't know that he'd had talk back experience. So then he's inside a studio and his end link, where he's obviously filling to a hard count, his end link is, well, it was a wonderful day here in the studio, which obviously is, you're in a studio, it's not a lovely day, it's a lovely day outside, isn't it? And then he just went, Jessica Ennis, good night. What? And that was it. Was she on? No, she. I think she'd been competing. She'd been competing, yeah. She wasn't in the studio. It was... He went, Jessica Ennis, good night. Yeah, so someone in his ears probably said, reference Jessica Ennis and what she did. Like, you know, she might have won her event or something. And so he's he's trying to like filter all of that shit out. He's listening to the count. Everything's happening at once. And he just goes, it's been a lovely day here in the studio. Jessica Ennis, good night. <laughs> that, was <laughs> that was it. But I quite like that. I quite yeah. like the fact that it's not polished and that it is kind of real. But it I guess as the sense. TV, <laughs> it does have to make <laughs> Jessica Ennis good night. Yeah. The thing is, we should say as well in his defence is that he's probably been stitched up there, Laura, inadvertently because he's either not used to doing that or someone should be saying other stuff in his ear. Yeah, you should never get to that point. No, like I completely agree with you. I would never blame the presenter for that. The only thing that, that you could ever level at a presenter is you've not done your homework. And I doubt that was it. I imagine it was just that he was not used to that environment and he was thrown in the deep end. And he had so many things to think about and it's really scary. Like, it's really scary when you don't get it and you're like, oh, shit. It's like, yeah. It's so was he relatively new? Was he quite new in his role? Was to that role, young? yeah. Right, okay. What about, what about Derek Thompson? From the horse racing, where <laughs> he's cute, he's they're doing like a what's it called when you shoot to someone? You shoot to someone who's like interviewed, like a cross. Yeah, I'm gonna cross over to, can't remember who it was, <laughs> and he goes, oh, and he's got a lovely lady with him. Lovely lady, <laughs> and he goes, is that it's that pause? It's just the pause of the guy he's crossed over to to go. It's a man actually. <laughs> and it was just like what. It's a man, Derek. It's fucking it's so, so bad, good. Isn't it? It's, it's like, incredible. You couldn't have scripted it better. Like if they if they actually tried to make that happen, it wouldn't have been so perfect. Like oh. every every personality, even the man's face, the kid's face, and he was like, he was like, what? What's going on here? What's going on? It's a man, actually. Not quite as. What, I think this is my all-time favorite. Uh, in fact, he's had a couple of fuck ups. John Inverdale. He fucked up with oh. Capri. No, no, it's rose canted spectacles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was going to get to that okay. one. I went. He's had a couple of fuck ups. The first one uh, with the tennis player, Marion Bartley. He said something offensive. Yeah, I'm going to defend him here. Oh, partly, okay. partly so I can we go with what did he say? Offensive. Oh, good job. She's a tennis player. Her parents have obviously said to her, "She's not you're not much of a looker or something like that. Oh, okay. So Why he, sa he said something slightly derogatory about Mario. Marion Bartoli. Mary Balotelli. Brilliant. <laughs> Mario Balotelli. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with a fuck up and not explain it. He did a fuck up uh, describing a female tennis player. Mm -hmm. That wasn't good. That was the one. That was Marion Bartoli. Yeah, so yeah. I thought you were going to go with a the defence there. Oh, I, 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 on. I will give you the defence, but it's sort of the same for both. But the Marion Bartley, so he has been anchoring Five Lives coverage uh, of Wimbledon, probably at that point for 10 or 11 days of the, of the two weeks. And each day he's been speaking live for probably eight hours. A long time. It's a long time. And Laura, you know what it's like when you're trying to present? You, your brain is giving you lines to say and... Another part of your brain is going, is that what you want to say, Laura? What are you going to say next, Laura? Oh, my God, Laura, what are you going to say? I think that's what's happened to him there. Oh, no. And, and also, you do think, don't say that, and then you say it. Oh, 
It falls out sometimes. Yeah. Uh, gaff number two, Joe. The ga- the second one. This one's in fact the second one isn't about speech. It was about looks. He was presenting on the rugby on BBC, and it like panned out. You know when they do the shot as they're finishing the show, so it goes full length. Usually it's just half length, full length, and he's got this suit on. And then he's got these like untied muddy boots on that he's just had tucked under the table, but then it showed <laughs> and there's like mud everywhere. So that was his second one. And then the third one was again, it was about horse racing. I can't remember who he was talking to, but he then turned around and went, Yeah, well, if we're looking at it from a rose cunted glasses, uh, <gasps> and he carried on for a bit and then realized, I apologize for that uh, mistake and then moved on. <laughs> I thought it was wonderful. But what is going on his, in his head? For him to get rose tinted and rose cunted. <laughs> oh, it was that. Yeah. Now, okay, you've explained it. I think he's caught between rose tinted and rose coloured. Or he thinks the person he's talking to is a massive, massive cunt. <laughs> but is that not an example, Laura? So, with John Inverdale, who has been an award winning broadcaster, done it for yeah. decades, is extraordinarily good at what he does. He can make those errors. It just shows. That I could. <laughs> well, no, it just shows that everyone who broadcasts is on this sort of high wire, aren't they? Yeah. Because you only need one error. You could do 20 years of broadcasting. You say Rose Cunted once. The high wire thing is, it sounds a bit sadistic, doesn't it? But the high wire thing is probably why I do it, why I enjoy it. Because you're always like a millimetre away from making a monumental mistake. And there's something quite fun in that as well. Yeah. I mean, this will come back to haunt me one day when I make a monumental mistake. But you also, <laughs> I mean, we we have like word slips all the time on TalkSport and they're quite funny. You know, we do have a dump button. So if anything goes really wrong, you press the dump button and Sorry, it gets rid explain. of... What do you mean a dump button? A dump button is it will get rid of the last seven seconds and the next seven seconds. Oh, oh so it blacks out the whole, yeah, you go radio just, silence. It will just snip it and I don't, actually know how it works is it like a out. like an audio version of the girl that used to come up on your screen with the rainbow and the round clown thing at, do you remember that end, when it that was weird channel four <coughs> yeah a bit like that but you wouldn't know you wouldn't know to listen oh you wouldn't it would it just snippets it out of thin air and then it catches you up and i don't think we're i don't physically know how it works but basically there's a dump button so if anyone does anything because we have live listeners calling in the show and they are they are feral sometimes. So they could, <laughs> they say anything. They could say anything. And I used to do the phone in at like it was like eight o'clock at night, and um, it would be all the football fans leaving the grounds in the cars with their mates, and they were all hammered. And they used to call up and say all sorts of things, and it was hilarious. But we'd always have the dump button just in case. Talking about feral listeners, what about um, when you get a listener come on, and you've got to try and keep your cool and stay <laughs> calm and collected. But the passion you have for your football club mm. takes over and you start going at a particular Spurs fan <laughs> for having a small minded, a small club mind, mindset. What, how did that go? I was just, I was pissed off that day. I was, I was pissed off because we'd, we'd basically, we'd missed out on top four the week before. It was pretty much done. It was like second to last game of the season. We knew it wasn't going to happen. Last game of the season, we had Everton. Everton were on the beach. They'd, they'd already survived relegation. We knew we'd win there. But, Spurs had Norwich and they were never going to lose to Norwich because Norwich are already down and, and really shit. And um, <laughs> so I knew it already. So I'd spent a week of knowing that Jamie O'Hara is a Spurs fan was going to be like in full force. I knew that we were going to have callers that were Spurs fans and I'd been handling it very well. But that shift is early, right? And you're tired and you get annoyed and there's just so much going on. And it's, you're on air for four hours. So it's like four hours from 6 a.m. I get up at four. Like if I'm a little bit grouchy, <laughs> it's all right. And this Spurs fan just came on and it was more like the tone. It was like his tone. He was like, I don't know. I just think that's a small club mentality. And I was like, fuck off. <laughs> just, just, you didn't say fuck off, but you might as well have. In the, <laughs> the reaction to it, it was like, right, he's fucking getting it now. I've had enough. I'm not going to be professional anymore. I'm going to be a fucking football fan. Do you think and I'm coming for you. I thought it was fucking brilliant. <laughs> it was passionate. Yeah. It was uh, to the uh, point. And it was good to have a bit factual, of... factual, though, It wasn't was it? factual. Yeah. Although the bit where you went, actually, I think you've got a small club mindset. I was like, 
you, you've got a better comeback. <laughs> that was like brother sister, but like mm. shit. Wasn't nah, it? Nah, that was nah, literally nah. like, well, I think. But I, yeah, I again, I sometimes I just lose my mind with it a little bit. But it's it's because it's like you say it's because it's football, and in a way you're allowed to be a little bit like that in football. You're allowed to be a bit petty. Right, staying on football then. Yeah. Um, worst manager to interview, and f- so worst manager and then favorite manager. Oh, favorite manager is a new manager. Thomas Tuchel, I mm. I don't know what it is, right? But there is something mesmerizing about him because he's so articulate. There's something about the Germans, like oh, yeah. Klopp, Klopp as well, right? Klopp's fantastic to listen to. Klopp, Klopp on a good day, though, is amazing. If you get him on a match day and it's not going to go well or it hasn't gone well, like he can be quite difficult, but I still, he's one of my all time favorites. Um, Thomas Tuchel is, is a new favorite just because he just, he's just very engaging. And as you interview him, he's quite a tall character and he and he really, I like the ones that give you a lot of eye contact. And I was like, <laughs> I was quite affected by him. And after the after the interview... Sorry, I affected? Yeah, I was affected by him. Okay, yeah. fine. I was... Just, <laughs> I don't know what, quite affected. I, was I haven't affected heard that. by him. I don't think ever. I can't remember yep. what the question was. I had to ask him a question about something. I'll tell you what it was. It was when they got sanctioned. And they were going, they were flying away to their next Champions League game and they had no money and no budget. They weren't allowed to spend any money. So I was like, you know, what are you going to do basically? And he was like, well, I wasn't expecting this question. And uh, if I have to drive the bus myself, I will. And then I felt so... Sri Lankan. <laughs> yes, she's from Sri Lanka. I felt so bad about asking him that question, even though I'm well within my rights to. I apologised to him afterwards and he was like absolutely fine like there's there's literally no issue here and then the next time I interviewed him I think it was when Rudiger Rudiger was leaving and I managed to get a news line out of him so I was like wow he didn't need to give me that news line but he did so I always think but I prep them before and I'll say look if I've got a difficult question because of that one that I asked before I wanted to make sure we were still best friends at the end of it so I was like look I'm gonna ask you about Rudiger I have to it's my job I just wanted to give you a heads up so you know I'm not trying to trip you up or anything, catch you out. So he gave me he gave me the scoop essentially, and it was I thought it was really nice. So yeah, he's my current favourite. Um, Jose and me have had some real awkward interviews. Jose Mourinho, we've <laughs> we've had some really awkward ones. Um, the first time I ever interviewed him, he was manager at Manchester United. He was going to Chelsea when Antonio Conte was there. Chelsea were the better team at the time. Um, I think I think it was the season. He'd been sacked maybe the season before they finished 10th. Conte had come in. He won the league with them. Anyway, there was just this big spice between them. And the media, obviously, us lot had been like, oh, my God. So he'd banned every question under the sun. Couldn't ask anything, basically. And um, the only questions you want to ask are about his rivalry with him, about how they're going to do this and that, whatever. Anyway, I think they got pumped. I can't remember what, what happened, but they got pumped. But the actual interview was pre-match up in Carrington. And I honestly felt like the air was blue. He came in, he sat down. He didn't. He was literally staring at me as if to warn me off before I'd even said anything. I opened my mouth to ask the first question. And I sh- I'm sure it's a technique. He waits for like what feels like a minute to answer the question, but it probably only is like a few seconds. And I was shitting it. I honestly, I felt like I was sweating. The interview was itself wasn't even that bad, but there was one bit in it where he was like, what do you mean? I was like, fuck, what do I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I Shit, I've, I've I've I don't even know what one. question I asked. I don't even... And there was another one uh, and he got fired about three weeks after that, he got fired. Um, and then there was another one we went to Spurs. There was an incident on the pitch. He was right. VAR had overruled it or not given it. Might have been a penalty to Harry Kane. And he was like, it was, it was a Stonewall penalty. And I was digging a little bit. I was like, tell me about the incident. What, what, what do you think? And he was like, well, what do you think? And I was like, it's nothing to do with me. My opinion doesn't matter. He was like, yes, it does. Tell me your opinion. And I just refused, point blank. I was like, no, it's nothing to do with me. It's up to you. You tell me yours. But it was a bit of a standoff and it, and it went on for like too long. And I agreed with him, but I refused to give my opinion because it's not—it is nothing to do with me. And you, and in these situations, you can, if you really want to, you can say, "Yeah, I agree with you," but you've also got to try and stay as as down the middle as you can. So yeah, we've had a few of those standoffs, but then we get on fine. I came on the show quite a lot on Talksport. It's just what mood you catch them in. And it's like you in a post-match interview. If I come up to you and you've just lost, and I'm like, "Oh, Joe," like. 
<laughs> who is that? Fucking hell, is that yeah. so no, that's, that's And that's Joe's like, who are you? Joe. Oh, Joe. Like, tell me about all those bad things that happen and tell me about, like, that missed tackle that you made and that shit scrum. And you're like, oh, I don't want to. Like, you don't want to talk about it, do you? But you have to because it's like, that's well, your job. Yeah, I guess I've gone through uh, peaks and troughs in my career yeah. in, and the understanding with the media and how to do it. And why wouldn't you why wouldn't you want to talk to, like when you describe how do you call him jose jose Mourinho. Mm -hmm. i want to say jose so jose getting the arsehole or any manager getting the arsehole being asked a question <clears throat> you kind of like but unless it's a really shit personal question that is unnecessary you have a you kind of have a responsibility to answer it for, yeah. a for your fans and b for the sport in general to mm -hmm. To grow or or just be as popular as it, as it is. And I know it's easier said than done if you're off the back of getting pumped 4-0 yeah. or something like that. But you kind of have to front up and, and take it. Although some of the awkward interviews and answers that managers have given in the past are really good to watch and quite fun to do. <laughs> they are. Let's flip this one round then, Joe, because you are very used to being interviewed after matches. Laura, you are very used to interviewing people. Yeah after matches so i would like you joe to be the post-match interviewer and laura you can pick the sport that you've been playing Fuck. professional footballer um the scenario is you've chose football yeah i can do i used to play rugby i'll do rugby no i know as much about football as i do rugby <laughs> so laura you are the center half yeah. and you've um given away a pen you've lost three nil at home to in the derby you've given away a penalty in the first half um, you've missed a sitter, <laughs> then you've got sent off. Brilliant. Fuck in the hell, that so I don't know game. why your press officer has put Jonathan you up. Woodgate. Do you remember when he played for Real Madrid on his debut? <laughs> oh, yeah, no. own goal, <laughs> own goal, and sent off. <laughs> oh no! So Joe, you're interviewing Laura. Yeah. Okay. You've got how many questions? You got Laura? Three or four? Three. Yeah. Hi, Laura. Hi, Joe. Tough out there, wasn't it? <laughs> it was a difficult game. We gave it all we could, and sometimes things just don't work out well. Yeah, you, are you saying that's all that you could have given? <laughs> I'm saying it's all we did give. Ah. If we could go back, I'd probably do a few things more differently. And, and what sort of things do you think you would do differently? I think maybe I lost my temper a little bit. My accuracy was off. We weren't clinical enough today. We should really go again next week. And what did you have? That's your questions. That's your done. What? That's your three questions. Just three questions. Oh, okay, just before you go, Lord, what did you have for dinner last night? <laughs> <laughs> I see. I should have started with that one. But then you to warm her up. Like settle her down a bit. Laura, what did you have for dinner last night? I had a roast dinner, actually. Oh, lovely. Beef. Re beef. Yeah. It, there's there's this little bit of time, which is like basically dead air at the beginning of an interview. And that like that little bit of time, I can't remember who taught me this. There's always 10 seconds where you can have a quick chat with the person you're interviewing and you can just gauge their mood if you can't see it on their face and you can just win them over. And I will always try and tell a, a joke or something or go or empathize with them and go, oh, that was shit, wasn't it? And they go, yeah. And I go, Handshake right. or no handshake? Um, handshake if it's not COVID. <laughs> I always, I'll always handshake them. Or if I know them, I'll give them a hug. Like, a, you, like, I always think if you're a tactile person, it's okay to be tactile as long as you know those people. The ones that you don't know, don't hug, don't touch them. But I always would want to give, especially with the managers, I'll give a handshake. But there's that little small period of time before any interview that you can set the tone and you can make them feel safe with you. Do you is, is your job or the way you look at it when you're asking those questions, the post-match interviews, are they, because you spoke about liking Jurgen Klopp, uh, Thomas Tuchel, are they good to talk to and they give you some, and you like still want to be best friends with them or still have a good relationship with mm -hmm. them. But is your job to make them look good, answering questions, mm -hmm. asking questions to make them look good? So is it, or is it to ask questions that you think the fans want to know the answers to? And does that then affect what questions you ask? Because you yeah. don't want to upset Klopp because you actually want to keep a good relationship with him, but you don't give a fuck about Jose. Yeah. So you're happy to go, why are you so shit at managing Man United? It's yeah, you're there's there's actually a lot of variables in that. The the absolute best reporters will not give a shit about anything. And they will ask questions that will inevitably piss off one fan base because they don't care. Like they and and they're probably the best ones. 
But I always think you've got morals as well. So like, I try and I try and look at them as humans rather than um, just like someone that you need to get information out of. And I try and think of the human side more than anything first because. I do want their best reaction. And and even though their best reaction might actually be them blowing up and giving you an amazing interview, that never really sat well with me. Like when I was always doing my post-match interviews, I understand that sometimes what makes better TV is to be a bit more antagonistic, but I didn't really want to be that kind of reporter. I wasn't up for making a name for myself in that sort of space. I just wanted to ask clear, intelligent questions. And I wanted to try and get the most emotion out of them. But to answer your question, what's the number one responsibility, I suppose, is, is the question, isn't it, as a reporter? It is, I think it's probably, is it to the broadcaster or is it to the fans? It's tough, isn't it? They come hand in hand, I guess. Yeah, it is tough though. It is tough because one fan base might want you to protect their manager and not ask those delving questions or they might want all those delving questions answered because they want him out the next week. It's, oh, it's so hard. I don't know. don't know the answer, really. You also get told, Joe, when you start off as a journalist, you'll get some old uh, pro will put their arm around your shoulder and go, never become friends with a sportsman. Let's say yeah. you're working as a sports journalist. And I don't know about you, Laura, but when you're starting out, you're sort of thinking, why not? Am I going to be more of a dick to yeah. someone so we don't become friends? What if we are socialising together and we're going to become friends anyway? Mm. Do I act like a massive dick in their company so we don't become friends? But that can be hard, can't it? Because yeah. you will know people personally. Yeah. Let's say, let's say I had to reverse to my old job, Joe, and I was interviewing you. You did? Yes. <laughs> and what was the interview like? Well, I had great fun. Yeah. Was that... Well, oh, fuck. You manipulative fuck. <laughs> Were you doing that nice so that then we could work together later on? No, I had no idea this podcast would happen. Okay. It was, I was, it bored was nice. Of, it I was, was yeah. Because we talked... Oh, you were bored? No, no. Because what would happen... In that, so in that scenario, I'm at the World Cup in yeah. 2019 for Five Live and I'm going to talk to a different England player every day and it's going to be one or two or three and it might be a coach put up. And obviously by the time you and me sat down, it was quarterfinals. Yeah. So I've spoken to a fair few of the England players and coaches and you've got your favourites. Um, you've got the interesting ones and you've got the ones who mm. you come towards you, you know what it's like, and you're thinking... Mm. Rrr. Now with you, Joe, it was brilliant because we just sat down and talked nonsense basically, didn't we, for about half an hour yeah. while the press officer tried to stop us. <laughs> yeah, but fuck them. Yeah. Do you know what? Because I liked what you just said there about the you, as an interviewer, you go for the human yeah. before you go the job or the role or whatever you're trying to get out of it. And that's the sort of flipping mentality that I had with the media, with the rugby media, that I never used to have. I used to see them as evil yeah. and they're always looking for an angle they're always going to shoot you down they're just looking for all sorts so i'd be like fuck you fuck, 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 fuck you. and that was bad because yeah. it was it. but then you go well why don't i ch and without ever thinking of them as a human or their story or what's going on in their lives or just so i try and go with that now and 2019 was sort of a turning point for me when i so that oh, was Tom. Japan, right? That was in Japan. I was like, oh, Tom. But rather than see it, I was like, hi, Tom. Nice to meet you. How are you? So was Tom your changing point? Did, did was Tom your, when you changed? Don't you, you ever. <laughs> I changed you. <laughs> is that what happened? <laughs> Who is the best pundit in any sport oh. out there? Um, I will go for Gary Neville Ooh. in football. Why? When I watch pundits... I will judge them on how much I can learn from them. So I'm not a professional footballer, but if I'm listening to what they're saying and I'm like, oh, that's really interesting actually, then I, I really enjoy that pundit and I like, and I, and I find him the most engaging as well. And I think he's just intelligent on lots of different levels. When I first started working in football, he was the one I was most scared of because I'd heard <laughs> completely wrongly, I'd heard that he was um, difficult to work with. So then when I first met him, I was like, shit, that's Gary Neville. And I was like worried about it. The nicest of all of them to me, the nicest. And as I've gone through my career, I will always credit Gary actually with um, pulling, pulling me up to his level. So if I ever work with Gary, he is the one pundit that, I mean, there's others obviously I love working with, but he is the one pundit that I will never have a bad day with because I'm so much sharper when I'm with him. It's weird, isn't it? And I don't know why that is. 
I, I think it's I think it's a level thing. I don't want to. He's up here, and I see him as up there, so I'll make sure I'm up there. You bring too. your game to yeah, yeah, to, for him to his level. Yeah. He did also uh, come out with one of the great goalgasms of all time. <laughs> so you f- good. Are you it? familiar with it? Oh. When he did what? The I'm goalgasm. I'm going to find. Listen to it all the time. <laughs> I love him because he's so passionate. Like yeah. you, can, you, it comes across, and that's why I find him so engaging because he's so passionate about football, yeah. and he just wants to come through the screen and and tell whoever's listening or watching there everything he knows about it and break it down as simple as he can to make you understand and love it as much as he does that's the thing isn't that great but that's what you want the flip to that is i love roy Keane as well yeah me too who is sort of the opposite where you go well he's the most negative bloke you're going to come across as a pundit but he's so fucking funny do you know what's surprising if you got it i've got it yeah get get the gold guys out it might be what Is that legit? Yeah. He's still going. Unbelievable. <laughs> Incredible. How early in his career was that? That was early, wasn't this it? It's 2012. It's Chelsea against Barcelona. The semis of the Champions League, is yeah, it? Yeah, they win it. Time. Yeah, so t- they've been under the cosh the entire game and Torres breaks away. And that is, inc- that is incredible. It was so long. But Roy Keane... Roy, Roy. How does he get away with being so negative? Because he's, he was so good as yeah. a player. He can say what he wants. He's he's won everything, hasn't he? And he's, he's just... And the thing is about Roy is he is charming. Like, you know, when I said earlier on, I'm, I was affected by Thomas Tuchel. Yeah. I'm affected by Roy Keane because he was another one terrified of him. The first time I ever worked with him... I was presenting the Carabao Cup final and it was my first final I'd ever presented. And he was the guest, one of the guests. And I was like, shit me. And I genuinely was nervous about it. But again, in the same way that Gary Neville did, I was like, oh, I have to up my game for Roy. But what was really lovely about Roy, it wasn't the final actually, it was the semi-final because it was a Manchester derby. It was Man City, Manchester United, or the other way around. I think it was at Old Trafford. And um, I can't remember. Anyway, I... Um, I was standing next to him, top of the show went fine and everything. We were in rehearsals, that was it. We were in rehearsals and there was a graphic about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer in semi-finals and how he was really dreadful in semi-finals. And um, I had my ears in, so I couldn't really hear much else that was going on. Because once you put your ears in, like they kind of suck out all the rest of the noise, it's gone. And I was just messing around with the director and the producer and I was like going through this rehearsal about what I could say about Oli Gunnar Solskjaer in semi-finals. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll just say Oli hates the semi. <laughs> and then as I looked to my left, <laughs> as I looked to my left, Roy was looking at me and I was like, oh, fuck. But he, la- he laughed and it was like, oh, phew, he doesn't mind a semi joke. So it was all right. So that was like breaking the ice. And then the top of the show went well. Everything was great. And then during the game, like, uh, everyone's standing up. Him, Micah, Richards, me. I can't remember who else was. I think it was just us three, actually. And, um... I was like, just felt like, I felt myself kind of gravitating towards him and wanting to ask him questions. And he he kind of commentates, not all the time, but he'll commentate his way through the game sort of thing. And then I asked him a question and I thought, shit, this is either going to go really well or really badly. I just asked him a question about something like, well, why has that happened? He was like, well, this is why it's happened. And he was like, really, it was like a teacher. I went, fucking hell. And I wrote it all down. I thought that'll make a good question at half time and everything. And I found that I've only worked with him three or four times. And every time I've worked with him, he's been so um, generous with his information and welcoming. And um, this this is going to sound bad, but sometimes as a female, and I don't want to make this a, oh, a female thing because I hate going on about it. But as a female, when, the beginning part of my career, I used to have this thing where I was like, now, d- is this pundit okay with women or not okay with women? And... I was like, I wonder if Roy's okay with women. And he was like, more than okay. Like, just amazing. Just brilliant. Yeah. The only thing about Roy is, and it's a question as well, is back to the responsibility you have as a pundit. When you've got so many people that follow and listen to every word you say, you've got to be so careful. Like the Harry Maguire, for example, he has... Yeah not been very good for Manchester United. Not been very good. Like even my eight-year-old knows that. Mm. But I go, well, Jasper, why do you think Harry Maguire... Why are you saying Harry Maguire's not been very good? 
oh, well, everyone says it. You know, I've seen Roy Keane say it. And you go, well, okay. So then they do have a responsibility to make sure that what they are talking about is based on fact yeah. and not just your personal opinion or emotional mm -hmm. opinion from it. And that's the only bit that I have with him. But I also love it. I yeah. love how hard he goes. He, just does, he doesn't give a shit, does he? It's funny. He just says, says it how, how it is um, and what he wants. But if before, when you do um, pre and post match interviews, you will get a player from each team. And I remember doing Manchester United a few years ago, and the player said to me, Who's in the studio? I was like, What do you mean? He went, Which pundits? I went, Oh, uh, and he went, Is Roy in there? And I went, Yeah. And he went, Oh. Oh, so yeah. he still has that influence. And so they've got him in their heads before they're playing. Oh, imagine having that as a pundit, just being like, The power ridiculous so much power you've been absolutely brilliant i've loved sitting here talking to you uh what's the dream though because you're already up there i've mentioned you've been sports presenter second year running now yeah. you you'd arguably be at the top of your game what but what is the dream job do you want to carry on in sport and get like a, mm. a even bigger gig or do you want to do something really random and obscure like Takeshi's castle <laughs> oh, great show do that great show and total wipeout yeah, I mean, I do, I have thought about moving out and branching out and doing something else. And if there's anything cool out there that I could do, then then I'd definitely look into it. But there's like, there's this thing that you get with sport that you don't get with anything else that I've The darts must be insane though. Yeah, like you, the sport is so unpredictable. You, you never know what's going to happen. And you don't get that with anything else. Everything else is very like, I don't know, just it. It's very structured. Whereas with sport, you've got no idea what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to come next. Your running order could be ripped up and rewritten five times. And there's like this just level of, um, there's a buzz that you get from live sport that I have never got anywhere else, basically, which is why I'm so obsessed with it and I so want to stay in it. The darts is like, the darts is amazing. The darts Carnage, is, surely that's carnage. It is have you been before, Tom? Carnage. Do you know, I've never been, I've come close to going and we've had... What do you mean, like outside? <laughs> yeah, just got bored and stood outside. Driven past. <laughs> we've weirdly, from the Crouchy Pod, where you will see references to, to things we talked about on the Crouchy Pod on signs at the darts. You get a bit of Mike Dean slaughters chickens. So many of those. A lot of those doing so the rounds. <laughs> the darts. Yeah. Fuck's sake. The, I really, the really... Darts. We're going to have to do a work do, I think. Yeah, so good Please, to the darts. Uh, do, you, do you want to work for... It's a pretty big come down to come and work for our show, if I'm honest. Oh, I didn't know how to work. I thought. Well, we called it a work do. But it's a work do. But it's you're a social work event, is it? Now, are you? Oh yeah. <laughs> Unless technically you've been on the day. show now, so you have worked yeah. with us, mm. right? If this is called work, yeah, you can go. And can fuck I? off. You can get us into the darts. We should be asking you, <laughs> Laura. It has been wonderful having you on the show. Thanks. Thank you for coming and telling me all about presenting and how difficult it actually is ah oh, thank you thanks for having me i loved it thank you laura fake thank you from her she's good <laughs> what no. trust issues <laughs>